Yeah, sure thing. Well, good evening. This is John Milburn for Laws 11057. Introduction to Law. This is Term 2 in 2017. We've got, as you could probably see, a number of people online and welcome. It's very good to have a good roll up of people for this course. I must say I've got a good feeling about this cohort and the reason is that um, people have responded extremely well even before we started term to conversing through Ucrew. The dialogue is good and I'm getting some emails as well. So the preferred way that I like to engage with students is essentially collectively through these sessions every week, through maybe some special sessions that we have from time to time, but as a routine through Ucrew. And Ucrew is, not that I'm on Facebook, etc., but people tell me it's got elements of social um, uh, networking, um, and communications that are familiar to them. So Euchre is the preferred way of communicating. So if you've got a question for me, um, odds are it's a question that should be asked of me through Euchre. But bear in mind, it's an interactive process. I'm not here just to simply impart information, but it is intended through this course, that we, at least the way I, I like to run the course, to be interactive. So what that means is that I encourage you to add material, add content to what you're learning through Ucrew. So if you find a good website, if you find a good document, if you find something that helps you, then please share it through Ucrew. Upload that information, that document, whatever it might be. Um, from time to time, very occasionally, I disagree with a comment that's made, but don't worry. If you make a comment, and or if you make a statement, perhaps in response to a student's question, a colleague's question, and I disagree, I'll make sure that I'm very carefully um, uh, correct that. And technically it's social networking. Yes, so that's what it is. Social networking was the term that I was after. Okay, um, so that's what we, we try to do during this course. Our prescribed text is the new lawyer, it's an excellent text. It's one that I've used for a few years now, and we'll refer to that often, but there are many other textbooks that are useful for the course. And I'll introduce you to some of them now. One that was prescribed until very recently, but still extremely useful, is this one, called A Practical Guide to Legal Research. It's a Thomson Reuters publication, and um, it's got some step-by-step -step processes in terms of how to um, uh, undertake legal research. Some other publications, and I won't go through too many of them, but this one is also Thomson Reuters. It's by uh, Russell Hinchy, The Australian and Legal System. It's very good. I mean, a lot of these are good, and um, it's a line ball decision as to which of these I prescribe as the um, text for the subject, but that's an excellent one. Uh, LexisNexis, Lawyering and Positive Professional Identities by Field, Duffy and Huggins is also a very good text. You can see that one there. I'm mentioning this not necessarily so you go out and race and buy them, but you might be able to refer them uh, to them through um, through uh, the library, both here and uh, the Supreme Court. Oh, by the way, when it comes to the Supreme Court, and I'll make a note to this, I'm going to urge you to go up there and have a look. Supreme Court, does anyone know where it is? Has anyone been to the Supreme Court library? Here's a chance for you to unmute your microphone. James has been. He knows where it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is James? Oh, sorry. We had two coming at the one time. I'll just hear from James on that one. Sorry, only because I was looking at him first. Where was that, James? Yeah, I pop into the Supreme Court every now and then. Yep. So have you been up to the library? Been to the library? What was that, sorry? Have you been to the library? Yeah, I have had a look in the library. It's very good. Level very 12. Good. It's excellent. Who else has been to the library? Thanks, James. That's right. All right. So level 12, um, and my particular favourite study room is study room number five. I'll post a photo of, uh, of my study room, and it's free. It's great facility. So some of these textbooks that we refer to, you can find those in the library resources. Um, now, there's a lot of reading to do in this course. Um, it's just a fact of life that when you're studying law, there's a lot of material. And 
to some degree, I need to encourage you to tr do everything at once. It might seem a bit funny. It might seem a bit odd that I'm encouraging you to do that. But law is not a linear process. It's not a matter of starting at the beginning and working your way through. You need to develop a technique of being able to move from one thing to another and be broad in your outlook. By that I mean, if you're studying contract law, you will obviously be considering laws to do with contracts. But in practice, it doesn't work as neatly as that. You don't have a client who comes in and says, I have a dispute in relation to contract. It's contract law. It's an issue to do with um, acceptance of an offer and, the, and uh, communication of that acceptance. Can you give me some advice? They'll come in with a problem and they probably won't even describe the problem in a, a, a proper legal manner. They'll, they'll, it'll, it'll be up to you to ask your questions in a way as to extract the material facts and then apply the law. And the law, of course, might be contract or it might be torts or it might be administrative law, it might be consumer law, but you have to decide where to look. And to that end, you can be creative. Um, people don't necessarily think of law as being a creative industry, but it is, in that your job is to create solutions. And there's a whole range of ways to do that. To do it, of course, you need to understand the law and be able to apply the law, but you must do so by reference to the material facts and identifying the legal issues. We'll talk more about this during the course, but what I guess I'm leading to is an acronym. You'll hear some acronyms during the course of your studies. This one I'm referring to is IRAC, I-R-A-C. I'll get you to write that down, that acronym. So what does IRAC mean in the context of that brief discussion I've had about identifying the issues, identifying the legal rules, and applying those rules so that you can come up with a conclusion for your client. Do you get the idea? So IRAC, issues, rule, application, and then conclusion. So there are a few different acronyms that you'll read about, and then you can choose which one works for you. I actually like um, CIRAC, but kind of, S-M-I-R-A-C, which is conclusion first, that's what I like to do, and then put the material facts, which is the M, C-M, and then the issues, then the rules, then apply the rules, and then restate the conclusion. Does that make sense? So when you're looking at a legal problem, when you're speaking with clients, when you're writing an opinion or an advice, or you're preparing a response to a legal answer, uh, a le uh, an answer to a legal problem, just think about the acronym and the format that works for you. But that's a pretty tried and tested uh, formula. And you'll see that a lot. When you read a case, without it actually having those headings, you'll probably identify it and you'll say, okay, I can see what the judge is doing here. The judge is starting by stating the material facts that are relevant to the case. I get that. Now the judge is making a statement about the legal issues that apply in this case. Now, the, now the, the judge is talking about the law, is talking about the statute. And now they're saying, in this case, um, applying the material facts to the, um, to the uh, rules, we come up with this conclusion. So you can see that legal logic evident in the way that um, judges write their material. Okay. I'm tailoring this course as though you're going to be practicing in law. I know some of you won't practice in law. Some of you perhaps aren't doing this course as part of a law degree. However, I make no apology. The approach that I'm adopting is for those that wish to practice. But it'll be relevant even if you're not practicing because at least you know the way that lawyers are intending to practice or do practice so that you can understand the process in a better way. And if you're going to practice, I guess you need to consider what your aspirations might be in practice. Look, I'm sort of big on quotes, and I'll, I'll just give you this quote. It's from Justice Gagler of the High Court a couple of years ago, and he said, uh, his honour said, don't, you don't say he said, you say his honour said, you may go on to become great advocates for the poor and the oppressed in social justice litigation. If you do, if that's your ambition, 
then I don't want to dissuade you. But you should recognise that you will be contributing hugely to social justice simply by being a competent and ethical lawyer, solving your client's problems. My advice to you, says Justice Gagler, the most inspirational and constructive thing I can say is go forth and build bridges. And I think I like that quote because what it tells me is that if you're going to be applying law and studying law, practicing law, you may do so with great ambitions in terms of dealing with social injustice, or you may simply decide that you want to be honest and competent and ethical. And if you do that, then according to what his honour said, and I agree, you will be contributing hugely to social justice. So don't necessarily think that you have to practice law in having uh, landmark cases that you're dealing with. Just by doing your job properly, you'll be contributing to the whole system very well. Okay. Um, and also, if you um, want to ask a question, please feel free to unmute your microphone or use the chat facility. What I think we should do now is have a look at the front page of Moodle. I'm going to attempt to share my screen here. If it doesn't work, please forgive me, um, but it should work. We'll see how we go. Can you now see my other screen? It should have the Moodle page on it. If I could just have a thumbs up or a yes, all good? All right. So you'll see here the Moodle page. This should, of course, now be familiar to you. This Moodle page setup is relatively new for me. It's a simplified version, and I hope that you find it relatively easy to navigate. Now, on my screen, there's some, probably some things that you don't have. For example, over here on the left is a Q and A. If you do have that, that's not my intention, because that implies that that's where you to ask your questions and provide the answers. We don't do that. We do that in my course through UCrew. So below my picture and the welcome um, tag, you'll see UCrew. And for those of you that haven't made your way to UCrew, you'll see that just here under latest information and the UCrew unit discussion. Click on that and we'll have a look at it shortly. Over on the top left hand side, you'll see the unit profile, news forum, which is really announcements from me from time to time. And below that, we have the assessment regime. As I said, not all of this that's on my screen will be available to you. So I've got a different version slightly. But you should see some of these key points. So assessment one, let's get down to it. It's due on the 3rd of August at 11.45 p.m. It's worth 20%. Assessment two on the 14th of September. And assessment three is a take home exam. I'll release it on Tuesday, the 3rd of October and it's due on Wednesday, the 4th of October. So can you see that? Has everyone I got an idea there? That's the assessment regime. So it works on 20% for the first assessment, 40% for the second, and 40% for the take home exam. If you click on that link, you'll be able to go to that assessment piece, and that procedure is replicated uh, down here below the link to UCrew with the same links. That'll take you to the same place. Okay, let's have a look at the assessments now. The first one, due on the 3rd of August, 2017. There's a standardization for the most part with my assessment pieces. Most are due on a Thursday evening, 11.45. And they're then, uh, sorry, they're, they're released, uh, th sorry, they're due at that stage, but there's a cutoff. And the cutoff is normally nine or 10 days later. There's no cutoff for the first one. Um, we give you that little free hit. But the task overview is there. And what you need to do is prepare a professional portfolio. And you can use this throughout your career. This is a really good in innovation. This is something created and advanced by Associate Professor Scott Beatty, who is one of my bosses. And it's very different to the assessment regime that I used to um, use in introduction to law. So I'm still a bit behind on the technology, I'm sorry, 
And I know that some of you have attempted to set up your cqulaw.net account, being a Google account, and you haven't been successful. That's because of me. I'm, I'm the one that's created that problem. But I will fix it hopefully by tomorrow. And if you do find a way around some of the technology and you're willing to share it, which I encourage you to do, please provide that information generally for um, uh, your colleagues through Ucrew. And you'll see that um, Sharon Slater, a student I had from last year, provided some excellent material, which I'm sure that uh, uh, you might be able to use. And if you come across Sharon in your studies, please thank her for uh, the help that she provided you through me in this course. Okay, um, I do expect people to submit their work on time. I'm just gonna shop, stop the share for a moment because I need to engage with you on this. Okay, we know that we're here to be assessed. It's a part of it. The more important part is learning, but we have to have an assessment regime. So given that we have the assessment regime, I do expect you to submit your work on time. Think of it as part of your legal training. Bear in mind that I said, I'm tailoring this course to people that are going to be in practice. <laughs> you can't walk into court on the first day of a trial and say, I've been really busy, I've had a cold, um, a few things have cropped up, so uh, can't do the court can't do the court court case now, judge. But we'll do it later. Um, that doesn't work at all. So you need to train yourself to that process of having things ready on time. If you're late, and I understand that things do happen, you can apply for an extension. But you must apply for the extension before the due date. Don't apply afterwards; otherwise, it'll be automatically rejected. If you do apply for an extension, and I don't encourage you to do so, but if you do, you'll need to have it supported by um, uh, material which supports what you're saying, medical certificates typically. Here's the first warning. I'm really tough when it comes to applying for uh, or granting extensions. And part of that is that I've been in practice as a lawyer since 1984, in my own right as a principal. So I know what it's like to have to sit to um, guidelines and I know what it's like to have to work through difficulties but you just have to do it. I know it sounds tough. Um, so if you apply for an extension don't be necessarily disappointed or take it personally if I say no. But I will invariably say as I'm about to say to you now that you can submit your work late. I will accept it until the final cutoff. The penalty is 5% per day deduction for the work that's late. Now, my cutoff usually, not for the first assessment, but usually my cutoff is the Saturday week. So I give you nine days to submit the work. If you come in on the ninth day after it's due, then you'll lose 45% of the overall assessment. That's what you'll, um, you'll be marked out of 55 instead of 100. But after that, I say no more assessments. And the reason I do that is we need to keep things moving. If you're that far behind, it's going to concertina, it's going to create an ongoing effect throughout the rest of the course. But most importantly, I like to provide feedback to students and I can't really provide that while there are student papers outstanding. So typically, for me at least, on the Sunday following cutoff or the Monday following cutoff, I'll provide feedback to you individually and to the class generally. So is everyone okay with that regime? Does it make sense? Trying to be tough, but not too tough, if you know what I mean, and fair to everyone. Okay, any questions about applying for extensions or comments about the fact that if you apply for an extension, I'll probably say no. Just being honest with you. Any questions, comments? No? All right. Um, so let's go back to the assessment regime. Share the screen, push the button, push the other button, and we're there. So that's the first one. Um, for this written for, for this portfolio, um, you are expected to upload it, and it becomes live. It becomes electronic. If you don't want to do that, if you don't want it to become uh, something which is uploaded, you can present something to me as a Word document, and I'll mark it but it won't be out of the full assessment. You'll, you'll lose, you'll lose a, a proportion, probably about five marks. Anyway, we'll have a chat about that 
more as we go through uh, the course. But do start looking at that now and thinking about how you'll create your professional portfolio. I know some of you will say, but I don't want to practice, to which I respond, but I'm preparing this for people that are intending to practice, so come along for the ride. And some of you may say, but you know, I'm sort of doing this more as an interest thing rather than for practice. Again, the same rules apply. So we're looking for this to be something of real benefit to people that are intending to practice. I went to a really good law school. I went to the University of Queensland and I'm very proud of the fact that I went there and I got good results and all the rest of it. But I think it's fair to say that after seven years of study and I, I finally worked in one of the biggest law firms in, in Queensland at the time, um, I didn't know how to do a will. I didn't know how to do a conveyance. I didn't know how to do a court mention. I didn't know how to do anything actually practical. Um, so my emphasis is quite the opposite to make it so that you can actually use things immediately. So I say that with all due respect to the Queensland University, I'm gonna do things a bit differently here. Okay, let's um, share the screen again. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Okay, so that's the first assessment. The second assessment due on the 14th of September. Again, we're looking at 11.45 p.m. on a Thursday, but this time there is a last day for submission. Saturday the 23rd of September at 11.45 p.m. 2,000 word limit maximum. Every unit coordinator is a little different. My view, and I try to outline this in the assessment, is, yeah, it's a word limit, but I do allow some flexibility on that. If you go beyond, say, 10%, then that's okay. But bear in mind this, that if you choose to go beyond the word limit, I'm going to look a little clearer critically to see if you actually needed to do so and mark you down. If, if the content is excellent and you've trimmed it back, but you really had to put that in, that extra couple of um, th those extra few words, you won't be penalised and you may be rewarded. But you take a risk. If you go beyond the word limit and I look at it and think, well, you really did, did not need that paragraph or you didn't word that well, um, then it can be it can become a negative. So just be careful with word limits. Other lecturers take a, a different view and they say, I'm not going to stop. I'm going to stop reading when you get to 2000. So that's a matter of knowing your lecturer. A little bit like knowing your judge if you're appearing in a court matter. Okay, so um, that's the uh, second task, which is your legal problem solving toolkit. Again, this is an innovation from Associate Professor Scott Beatty. It's an excellent innovation. And what we're aiming to have you do in the um, Legal Problem Solving Toolkit is create something that's actually going to be useful for you in practice. It will certainly be of great value to you in your third and final assessment, which is the take-home paper, which is what we call the, um, uh, the briefing paper. So the third and final assessment I'll release on Tuesday morning and. Um, it's due on the Wednesday the 4th. And uh, so there's nothing there yet, um, but it is there ready for you to um, submit your work. So this is, the, this is my page, your page will be different, but I get to view all the submissions. So when it comes to submissions, you do upload your work through um, Moodle. I'll go back to the first assessment piece. And if we look down the bottom, after the task and the material, um, again, sorry, mine's a bit different. It says view the submissions. I understand that on your screen, uh, it will have an opportunity for you to upload your submission and that's the way you do it. Um, in uploading your submission, just bear in mind that I've got a couple of preferences. And one of those preferences is that you submit your work in Word format or the equivalent if you're using Google Docs, rather than PDF. It's easier, for, I can convert it and I will convert it, but it's easier for me to check the formatting, the, the style of the writing, and um, I can do that more easily in Word. So Word, please, and single document. So don't submit in three parts. It makes it hard for it to go through the, what we call the Turnitin process. Are you familiar with Turnitin? Has anyone dealt with that before? Yes, we know what turn it in. Anti-plagiarism. Okay. 
So we do know what that means. Um, and um, so I, I, everything gets run through Turnitin, which means that we get a chance to see if it's um, uh, your work or not. Okay. Um, now, there's a question here, I think, from Sarah. What do you mean by evidence to support characteristics and skills? I presume that achievements includes awards for academic excellence. Uh, yes, um, exactly right. So when coming back to that first assessment in terms of your professional portfolio, we are looking for something which is broader than just your um, involvement in law because you've only just started in law. So other uh, evidence and uh, achievements academic achievements and excellence is, is um, spot on. And we can talk more about that later as well. Okay, so in a general sense then, does anyone have any questions about the assessment regime or the way in which you upload your work or apply for extensions? And I know it's only early days. Are we all good so far? Okay. All right. Do um, keep a probably a separate document, not just for this course, but other courses that you do, so that if a an examiner, if a course coordinator or a unit coordinator, we're called now, a lecturer says to you, "Look, this might be something that's worthwhile considering for the exam," jot that down, keep it in a separate document, so that by the time you get to week twelve, you have all these exam hints in the one place so you can quickly refer back to um, anything that may have been said. And um, we'll just toss it in occasionally. Part of it's to see if people are listening, if they're uh, on board with what we're saying. But uh, if somebody says, look, that's an no exam hint, then take it seriously. Okay, so what about the take-home exam? The take-home exam is a replacement for what we call an invigilated examination. Invigilated examination is where you attend at an examination centre and uh, you've got two hours or three hours to complete your work using handwriting. So we don't have to do that in Introduction to Law. Instead, I'll release a paper electronically and you have just over 24 hours to complete the task. The idea is that if you were sitting in an exam room, it would take you maybe two or three hours to complete it. But I'll give you 24 hours so you've got plenty of time to complete it depending on your schedule. And you might say, well, am I allowed to talk to others about this exam once it's released? Am I allowed to talk to others about the assessment? Um, I don't want to be pinged for collusion. Um, well, the answer is that you are allowed to collaborate. And collaboration's good. I encourage collaboration. So ideas, suggestions, uh, information, case law, legislation, anything you think might be of value to others, share it. And that's what we, we want to do. So collaborating is great, but colluding is different. Colluding is outright plagiarism. It's taking somebody else's work without acknowledging it and passing it off as your own. So we don't want that. There's an easy fix, isn't there? And the easy fix is to cite your material. So if you've got some work which is sourced from elsewhere, just acknowledge it. Now, what do you mean by citing the material? It's C E I. C-I-T-E. If you look in any textbook or, or case law, you'll see reference to citations. And um, I'm just looking at you know, just one of these textbooks now, and you'll see at the bottom of the page, usually in smaller font, there's a reference to the original source of the material. So that's the citation. That's the referencing material. So if you want to get around the issues to do with, oh, this is somebody else's work, or this is I've sourced it elsewhere, how do I deal with it? Well, just just acknowledge that he got it from somewhere else. You won't be marked down. You'll probably be, re be rewarded for that. And there is a bit of a skill to how you cite your material in, in law. So how do we deal with that? I, I mentioned that there's a whole book on um, legal research, which I showed you before. So, and there's also books on, um, and I haven't shown you this, but uh, there's a whole whole range of books on legal referencing. Have a look at the um, Australian Guide to Legal Citations. It's on the Moodle website and I'll give you a tip. It's a long document, but just go to the back. Just go to the back and it's got the summary 
and you'll see a quick guide to how to cite material. Another really good tip, it took me a while to work this out, is just have a look at the way that authors cite their material and have a look at the way that judges cite their material. It's pretty much the same. So if you read a case, and you can have to read cases, you can have, we don't read about cases, we actually read cases in this course. But if you read a case, you'll see that the courts will often, invariably, refer to other cases or legislation and the way in which the judges cite the material is exactly the same way that I want you to cite your material. So learn through osmosis. Just take in what they're doing and adopt it, that practice, that procedure as your own. Okay? So it means a matter of keeping your eyes open to, uh, to see what others are doing and then following suit. Oh, <laughs> when it comes to assessment, if you haven't already picked this up, I need to warn you that I'm really, really adamant in introduction to law about this. So here's an exam tip. Make sure that your material is presented professionally. The first time I took this course, I really was amazed and a bit disappointed at the number of people that presented work which looked to me sloppy. Um, how do, where do I start? So different fonts in the same document, different um, size fonts, inconsistent spacing, material that was not referenced properly, documents that weren't paginated, who knows what paginated means? It's one of my stupid words. Yes, Sarah knows. What does it mean, Sarah? Page numbers. Yeah, page numbers. <laughs> you'd, think, you'd think I'd just say put on page numbers, but I choose to go paginating. Um, so paginate your paper um, and just make it look professional. Now, why do we do that? Why am I such an introduction to law? Why am I even talking to you about that? You probably think that's grade five stuff. Yes, Sarah? Because it's a part of the whole learning process. This is my third degree. So um, it's something you do every course all the time because otherwise it like, gives you bad habits for later learning. Exactly. That's good. But that's, an, that's half the answer. Can anyone guess the rest of the answer? Actually, there's three parts to this. Yes, Gay. Can't hear you there, Gay. No, we just can't hear Gay. It's not coming through. But we'll come back to you, Gay. Now, um, Melissa raised her hand, but we'll Sundari, Sundari first. Can't hear you there, Sundari. Melissa? All legal documents need to be presented in a professional way with paginating on them and they need to be all set out in a proper and proper manner. Yes, which is good, but why? I'm looking for two more reasons why we do it. Sarah's given us one, which is it's good habit, we need to do it. Two other reasons. Why am I so fussy about this? Anyone else? Okay, Gay said she'll fix it for next time. James. Yes, James. Um, for record management. Like to, you know, manage your you know, keep it all uniform. So all um yeah, I was thinking more so it's all sort of along the same lines, you know, documents sort of this format over here and you know, over here you do your own thing. So it's all uniform. Yep, I like that and answer. Yeah, and then I thought, yeah, I suppose for you, yeah, not really managing your records. But yeah, it's so it's mainly to keep in a uniform format. Yep. Um, I like the answer. Not, not the two that I had in mind, but I do like it. Mm. Mm. Any other thoughts? Two other reasons why. Um, David. Yes, David. Because when you're actually practicing, you're going to have to prepare and issue documents to your clients, to the courts. It has to look professional and it has to be professional for that presentation. Yes, um, that's, that's one of the reasons. There's a little tail to that. 
the little tail at the end, which is the important part is, if you're charging $400 an hour for doing so, then people expect it. That you don't, what you don't want in practice, and I'm serious here, you don't want someone coming to the counter and saying, why am I paying $400 an hour for this? It looks like a dog's breakfast. It's got to look the part, okay? So spot on from a professional standards perspective, it's got to look persuasive, which leads me into the next and final reason why you would do it, and that is pretty simple, because I ask you to, because I'm the examiner. I'll be marking your exam, and I can't help it. First impressions count. So when I open a document and I see it's in PDF and it's not in Word, I'm not going to mark you down, but I'm going to be disappointed because I told you in, in week one, I'd, I'd like the, the document in Word. If you don't paginate it, I'm just going to go, oh, why isn't it paginated? Um, if you've got inconsistent font, I'll go, gee, I don't know if they actually read this. I don't know if they looked at it carefully. It just it doesn't look right to me. It must have looked right. And so even before I start to read, I'm getting a negative view on it. So for the same reasons that you need to convince a client that what you're worth is $400 an hour, you need to convince me that what you've presented is something that you're proud of, that you've thought about. And um, you won't hear me talking about this if you have me in third year but you will hear me talk about this in first year. So part of my job in introduction to law is to hand you over in good shape so that you know a lot of the basics and when you get to second year, the unit coordinator, it might be me in second year for, for some of them, but the unit coordinator taking your work in second year will look at it and go, ah, this, this group, they really know what they're doing. Okay, a couple of good questions. Um, oh, ben said, easy to read, simple as standard, and I really like that. Um, Sarah said, what about small fonts for large quotes that are separated from the main text? Yes, I like to drop a font size in doing so and to um, uh, indent. You don't have to, but no, normally I do. Sharon says that if you prepare work properly, it shows authority to your work. Gay says there's an expectation for professional careers your professional career starts tonight. Seriously. So we're on the right track. I want to be really proud of this cohort coming through. So that's, it's an expectation of your professional career. And you want people to take you seriously and you don't present unprofessionally. So that's excellent. That's uh, these some of the other comments. Sarah said legal requirements for legal research. Sarah, says, Sarah also said, what about small fonts? Yep, we did that one. Easy to read, said Ben. Are there preferences for the fonts in the legal industry? Look, my personal preference is not Times New Roman. <laughs> a terrible response, a negative. Um, I like, is it Ariel or, or um, Calibri? Uh, Calibri is, if that's the pronunciation, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's the one that um, Microsoft are telling us to use, so, so I just follow suit. Um, Times New Roman is the old-fashioned one in law. You'll see that in a lot of court documents. When I prepare court documents, I still do them in um, Times New Roman, only because that's the default for the um, court's uh, forms. Um, font size 12 space 1.5. There are different criteria that apply. What was that, sorry? Ninja Warrior. All right. So there are different um, uh, font sizes that you can use. I think 11 or 12 is a good idea. Um, don't go below that. And I think 1.5 or double spacing is, is a good idea. Um, what you can do is have a look at my sample document. Has anyone had a look at my sample document yet? You can just raise your hand. Yes, Anita's had a look. Kathy, a few have. There's nothing magical about it. You can do better than that. I'm just giving you an idea. But I do want you to have a look at my sample document in terms of an idea of format, but also content. So read it as well, because there's some information in there that might help you. Um, but you don't have, it's not prescribed. Um, and some of the material that I get in terms of papers that are presented from students, I think that is really professional. It's quite different to the way I presented in my sample paper. They've actually improved on it. Um, but generally speaking, without being silly about it, give yourself plenty of space in the document. Don't, don't be too stingy on the paper that you might use. 
when preparing a document for submission. If you look at a barrister's opinion, typically they're very widely spaced. There are double, one and a half or double spacing, probably 12 font. Uh, you've got good space in between paragraphs and, and they're not cramped up. You've got good space in between the areas of the main text and the part which is extracted by way of quotation. Now there's a practical reason for that in law, why you would want to space it out. Let's say an outline of argument. You're preparing an outline of argument for presentation to a court. Why would you want to ensure that it's reasonably spaced out? Practical reason. Any thoughts? Sarah? Easy to mark. Easy to mark. And conversely, if you're presenting it to a court, easy for the judge to read. And that's what you want. And you and also gives a, a chance to write some comments as well. So um, just think about that in terms of the way you present your material. Look, um, oh gosh, time is running away from me. You probably notice I don't like PowerPoints. So you won't see a lot of PowerPoints from me. I like to engage with people a bit more than just presenting PowerPoints. Here's a quote that I really like. If you've got the new lawyer, you can have a look at page 267, but I'm going to read it to you anyway. So it's on page 267 of the new lawyer. And I want you to kind of live by this idea. Thinking like a lawyer means keeping a cool and clear head and speaking and behaving rationally when others around you may be panicking or overreacting. I love that quote. It really captures it well. And the reason I mention that to you now is that during the course of your studies, you will feel like losing your cool. You will feel as though you're muddy headed. And you may feel that others are panicking or overreacting and you might feel that you're doing that yourself. So when you're studying law, when you're practicing law, you need to learn to build in the inner chill. By that I mean, keep that inner calm and that professionalism. You may have reached the stage where you're in trouble, but try not to let it show, okay? So there's a bit of acting in law. Um, so if you want to practice in law, just be prepared to be a good actor as well. So make sure you keep your cool. Um, and also, and you might think this is really silly, but it's examinable, then it's true. You've got to think about things in reverse. Now, what I mean by this is that if I get a, a legal problem presented to me and I have to write an opinion and it's going to become litigious, I actually start by writing my closing. You might say, well, so I get the facts, I get the material. It might be a contract dispute or whatever it is. I read through it all. I try to identify the material facts, try to identify the issues in my mind, try to think about what rules there might be that apply. And then I start to write my close. I say, okay, so the, in conclusion, we have a contract. We have parties to a contract. We have a dispute. We have this piece of legislation. We have this case law that applies. Considering the law to those relevant facts, here is the conclusion, Your Honour. So actually write that first. I mean, I'm subject to 20, it's modified 27 times. But I write that at the start and then I work backwards so that you know what you're trying to achieve at the end and then you work accordingly towards it. And laws are a lot like that in, in many ways. So from a practical perspective, I want you to think about working backwards. I'll give you an example. When I was, I'm a barrister now, but I was a solicitor in an office. So, so my wife phones me and says, um, really busy here, kids have been playing up. Uh, can you bring home takeaway? I'd really appreciate it. <laughs> what don't you want to happen? You walk in at seven o'clock at night. What don't you want to happen in that situation? You might think, oh, this is silly. It's true. You don't want to walk in empty handed, do you? So what happens if you get that call at two in the afternoon? What 
practical things do you do to ensure that you bring home the takeaway? Can anyone give me an ideas? What do you do? Make a note, write a note, write it down, set a reminder. Yes, yes. What happens if you don't look at the note? You write the note, you put it on the side of the desk and then some other paperwork gets on top. Set a reminder is possibly better. Job says set a reminder with something that beeps or which is good. Tell you what I used to do, but this is in the days before iPhones and you know things of that nature. I'd actually take my, as soon as I'd get that call two o'clock, I would, or say, you know, bring home milk. I would get my keys and I would there and then walk to the fridge and I'd put my keys in the fridge. Now, why did I do that? Why did I put my keys in the fridge? Set the alarm, says Annie. Yeah, but why did I put the key? And David, David's worked it out. By putting it in the fridge, you've associated the, the keys with the milk to remind you. Yes, true. It's a bit of a word associate, but it's more than that. It's actually more than that as well. Fridge associated with milk. Yep. <laughs> the keys are in the fridge because I can't tell you the number of times that this actually happened to me where I went to, to leave the office. I looked for the keys. You know, you do the whole pat down thing. Where, where are they? Oh, hang on, they're in the fridge. Then you walk into the fridge and they why are they in the fridge? Now I remember, it's because I've got to take the milk home. So what I'm asking you to do is think about what practical steps you can do during your studies and in practice to ensure that you don't let yourself down and don't let others down. Let's apply that same principle to a court matter. You've got a court matter, your client says to you, um, here's a reference, it's really important you bring this along, say it's a criminal law matter, and you go to court and you've started addressing the court in your submissions, your client's looking at you in the dock, waiting for you to produce the wonderful reference that um, uh, the client believes will help enormously, and you do the pat down. You remember, you think, oh, where's the reference? Oh, it's, it's back in the office. You can't ask for an adjournment. You can't stop the procedures and say, oh, judge, I just forgot something. Can you just hang on for, I'll be 20 minutes. Won't be long. See ya. You can't do that. So you've got, to, you've got to have it there ready to go. So you've got to have these practical things in place to ensure that you don't forget. Or worse still, um, you, you have it there, but you forget to submit it at the time. So think about, in line with my thinking that you, um, uh, I'm training you in a way to be actual practitioners. Think about what would work for you to ensure that you don't let yourself down or your client down. And um, the other reason that that's important is this. Stress. Stress is very real in law. Um, if you have a look at the new lawyer, page 346, the author says this. Learning self-management skills Sorry. I had a, a mouse that went haywire and here it is. Okay. So this is at three forty six. Learning self-management skills at law school is important if you're to ensure that you maintain good psychological health during and after your legal studies. For example, a study led by Catherine Lay assessed 955 students at the University of Adelaide and found that 58%, 58% of law school students were psychologically distressed. That was the high, highest level of distress recorded across all the disciplines by far. Medical students were at 44%. And according to that study by Catherine Lay, the study shows that there are special issues for law students and emphasises the need for students to take particular care of their psychological health. So I hope that you can now see the connect that I'm trying to make between things that are practical remedies to deal with issues in the context of thinking back, thinking from the end and working back and what I'm trying to say. 
So what I'm trying to say is let's go back to you walk in at seven o'clock and you don't have the milk that your wife asked you to bring home. You feel bad. What's it going to do to your psychological effect? It's going to think you're going to become deflated. You're going to think I've worked really hard. I've been really stressed. I just, I'm sorry I forgot the milk. Contrast that to the triumph, the relative triumph that you feel by coming home with the milk and everyone feels good and you feel good about yourself. So it all ties in, but it relies on this. You must be prepared to look at what you wish to achieve and think about ways to get there and at the same time, look after your psychological well-being. I hope that makes sense. I won't prattle on about that for too, or too much, but it is important. I'm, I'm saying it is important because many people fail in law, not because they don't understand the law or they can't study it or can't apply it, but they're just not well enough organised. They just don't have the keys in the fridge. They don't have the physical procedure to ensure that the reference given to them by the client is produced at the court at the time that it has to be produced. So you've got to think about those things and do something that works for you. So I can't prescribe it, but we might examine you on it. We might say, what have, what have you done? Tell us about the physical things that you've done to ensure that you achieve the result that you want to achieve. Anyway, um, I'm going to put a, th a few things on you crew by way of poll because as always, I've run out of time. One of the things I want to talk about um, on you crew is the way in which you use words in law to communicate. You can go the old fashioned way, which is essentially the way it was back in the 70s when I started, when I was studying law, or you can go the way it's supposed to be now. The way it's supposed to be now is we use short sentences, easily understood, and convey a message in a way that's intended to benefit the reader rather than to puff up yourself. Puffing up yourself by using silly and archaic words is what I call gobbledygook. We don't use gobbledygook anymore. If you look at a document prepared, say a mortgage or a lease from the 60s or the 70s, it makes your head spin. There's a lot of here and afters and the party aforesaid and all this sort of garbage. You know, just write something the way that you talk. Write in a way that's intended to better communicate to the recipient. It's not about you, it's about the recipient. So you'll be tested on that sort of stuff as well. So I'm going to put up, if I can work out how to do it, on you crew, I'll put up a poll and you can tell me which of two options you prefer. Another thing that I'll do on um, you crew is put up some of my favourite movies that relate to law and uh, ask you to uh, vote which is your favourite. So I'll have nine or so, but can I have some, and I'm, I know we're running out of time, but can anyone tell me The Good Wife? I don't know The Good Wife. Is that a movie or is that a show? Sundari? Is it a, it's a TV series. All right, well, we'll put The Good Wife on. That's to do with law, is it? Any others? Suits. Is that a movie or a TV show? TV, what was all these TV shows? I, I, I could put Breaking Bad if you like, but I'm really after movies. Liar Liar, yep, I like that one. All right. Any other movies that people think are inspirational, ben beneficial to watch? I'm actually going to encourage you to watch some of these. All right. Well, if you think of Legally Blonde, yep, Erin Brockovich, yes, all good choices. Killer Bockingbird, yep, that's on my list. Okay, so um, we'll have a, a chance to, to share some information about that as well. I, I just need to ensure that you understand this bit. And normally I don't talk this much. Normally it's much more interactive, but we're just sort of warming up. Here's an important difference between the law and something like science. There is not necessarily going to be a right or wrong answer in law. I'm much more interested in the way in which you identify the material facts and the issues and then apply the law. Your conclusion may be entirely different to mine and I might still give you a seven. How does that work? If you come from a maths background, that you'd be thinking, oh, that's weird. Better Call Saul, that's a good show too. Um, 
if you come from a maths background, you think that's that's crazy. But just think about this. When you're reading some of the cases in the High Court, you might see that the court was split, meaning that some judges went one way and other judges went the other way. So we call that a split decision. So it might be a 4-3 split in the High Court in relation to a particular case. Logically, I don't think we can say, therefore, that three of the judges are completely wrong, that they don't know what they're doing. It's just that they've come to a different conclusion and you're entitled to come to a different conclusion to me. So if in a particular case, you feel the need to argue a certain way, even though you think I might argue a different way, that's fine, do that. Um, there's no necessarily right or wrong answer in law. And law isn't necessarily a linear process, as I sort of said at the opening comments. We don't start at A and end up at Z. We can mix, match, take things from different disciplines, argue in different ways, reverse the order of the argument. I like to put the conclusion at the start of, a, of, of paper or advice. You don't have to do that. So there are certain things that I really want you to do, but there are certain, within that context, within that framework of professional presentation, there's a lot of room for flexibility and there's a lot of room for professionalism. I hope that makes some sense. So um, it's not necessarily something which is we start at the beginning and then work on from there. And just finally, I'm going to ask you to, yep, yeah, it's the way you present and justify your argument. Absolutely. Oh, and Devil's Advocate. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, movie as well. Um, so I think I started by saying you need to learn the ability to cover everything at once. During this course, we'll be talking about where the law is sourced, how it's applied, and um, not just looking at the new lawyer. We'll be referring to other materials. We'll be asking you to read cases, read legislation, and just try and take it all in. Share information with, uh, with each other. And one final tip is this. When it comes to knowing what the legal position is, if there is a legal position, um, most people go to textbooks first. I don't necessarily encourage you to do that. As good as textbooks are, they're really an opinion from a legal author about what the law is and an explanation. The other way to identify the legal rules is to go to the primary sources yourself. So the primary sources of law are legislation, which is parliament-made case uh, uh, parliament-made laws, or case law, which is the law made by judges. So they're the primary sources of our law. Legal textbooks are really secondary sources of law. I'm going to encourage you to go to the primary sources first up. So, but it, you've got to be careful. Um, and with experience, you'll know exactly where to go for those primary sources. But don't fall into the trap of just looking at the textbooks. You've got to learn how to find legislation and case law. And I think in Moodle, at some place, I have um, given you an indication of where to look for that. Ostley, etc. Has anyone found how to find, you know, if I said to you, uh, can someone find the Property Law Act 1974, Queensland? Do we know how to find that? Cindy's nodding. Yes. Others been able to find that? All right. Okay. Yep. Good. So it's really important. So please learn that skill and um, have a look at the notes in that regard. Okay. Do we have any questions? Oh, you've been very patient. And from now on, we will be more interactive. So I'm sorry I've done a lot of talking tonight. All good? Okay. All right. So lessons for tonight. Um, make sure that we share information through you, crew. Thanks very much for those who've already done that. Second thing is, it's up to me to get my act into, into gear to ensure that you can um, prepare your CQU law accounts, and we'll do that tomorrow. Um, from there, make sure that you think about what you want to achieve and work backwards and think about those practical things that you need to
put in place to make sure that things do happen and learn the primary sources of law and how to access those things. All good? All right. Yes, Sarah? I posted a question on the chat. It was just with regards to looking for legislation. Are we talking national or state as in Queensland or our own state or? Well, certainly both Commonwealth and state. Um, the course is primarily geared up for Queensland law, but I encourage you to look at your own state for those of you. We do have people that um, take these courses from overseas. So if you're in overseas jurisdictions, you can do that as well. Certainly for your own um, state is a good idea. I should say that um, I haven't really introduced myself properly. I'm, you probably say I'm a barrister and I'm, um, I do some work for um, tribunals, etc. Um, but what I um, uh, like to do as part of the work that I do for the university is to encourage you to use your own state laws as part of the legislation that you refer to. So if you take environmental law with me or you take um, alternative dispute resolution or evidence and proof or trusts or whatever it might be, uh, given the opportunity, I'll encourage you to, to refer to your own state. Um, but other than that, it'll be Queensland. Hope that answers your question, Sarah. Any other questions, comments? So do we, yep, so we've done that one. All right, good. Okay, well, we'll end the meeting for tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, continue to chat during you, crew, and we'll see you next week. All the best. Bye. Thanks, John. Bye.